yep, I'm Emma Douglas. Um, I farm on Gower with my family. Uh, we've got pedigree suckler herd of Welsh black cattle and Dexter cattle, and we do a lot of conservation, grazing, grazing nature rich land like nature reserves and common land across the peninsula. Um, we also have a small herd of Welsh mountain ponies and goats, which we'll try in a moment. So I used to, I worked for Pont, which is Wales's conservation grazing organisation, Pori Natura Thriftadai graze in nature and heritage. I worked for them for 12 years, um, during which time I was, <laughs> we did a contract for the National Park, uh, which is focusing on Gangor Common, which I'll come on to talk about. Um, I also, I'm a steering group member of the Nature Friendly Farmer Network, and I work part-time for uh, Pasture for Life as well. Lots of hats. So <clears throat> conservation grazing is grazing uh, for particular outcomes. So they might be for nature conservation, it might be for heritage management, it might be to uh, maintain um, traditional cultural heritage, uh, fuel load reduction for wild, uh, reducing wildfires, etc. Um, so why is conservation grazing so important? So first of all, it's important to maintain our landscape, it keeps um, you know, our hillsides hill open, keeps them as beautiful and as recognisable as they are. Um, it's also important because uh, large herbivores are part of our natural, part of our ecosystem. So uh, before they became extinct, we had elk, we had a suite of deer species, which obviously we still have some of today. Uh, we had bison, we had wild boar, we had tarpan, which are the ancestors of our native ponies. Um, and we had auroch, which are the ancestors of our native cattle breeds. So all of these species uh, and, the, uh, you know, and all our native habitats adapted to thrive under grazing pressure from these animals. And uh, we used to have predators as well, which would uh, move these species around. So nowadays we've got our, our native livestock and uh, we act as the predators by deciding how many we have, how we move them around, etc. So after the Neolithic agricultural revolution, we started to enclose land. We started using uh, the Havada Hendra systems so of transhumans taking livestock up to the mountains where we dwell during the summer and coming back down for the winter. During the summer, we'd make hay, uh, we'd grow crops, and then we'd bring the animals back down. They would aftermath graze those those little enclosures and uh, then we'd feed them on hay and keep them in little houses etc so it was all you know linked to the historic environment and with agriculture so we during those the period up until the second world war we had the most biodiverse habitats that we we ever had because we had all these artificially created hay meadows really really important habitats we've lost 97 percent of them uh, after the se uh, second world war unfortunately we also used to have native breeds so breeds are actually native to each particular area so they were adapted to the to the particular climatic conditions the parasites the the uh, availability of nutrients in the soil um the, you know, the weather all sorts of different things so unfortunately we've lost a lot of them because we've uh, been encouraged by agricultural subsidy by uh, supermarkets by the invention of the uh Haber bosch process uh so to, to kind of yeah, intensify agriculturally, which means we've lost a lot of these uh, native, our native breeds and our beautiful biodiverse ground. So it's really important to, uh, to disturb ground. This might sound a bit controversial, but <laughs> because naturally uh, land will succeed from like bare ground, it will succeed into, in this country, uh, a climax community of uh, native broadleaf woodland. So uh, disturbance factors like grazing, wildfires, landslides, earthquakes, all that sort of thing, floods, uh, are important to maintain a, a mosaic of different habitats. So um, yeah, really important to keep grazing pressure, otherwise we lose our grasslands, heathlands and scrubland and it will become broadleaf woodland which contrary to popular belief is not a good thing. <laughs> so just a little introduction to uh, the species that we use in conservation grazing. So 
obviously we've got sheep. Uh, they're a little bit of a bad guy, but um, they're not actually native to the UK. They come from Mediterranean, uh, but they've been very important in Wales's history uh, and very important economically for their, first of all, for their meat, then for their wool. And unfortunately now, and neither of which are worth quite as much, but they're an important part of Wales's culture. Um, they're really useful for some things like keeping scrub under control. So they're really good at eating brambles, come in their own woolly packaging so that they're resistant to a lot of weather conditions. Um, they're, they're small ruminants. Uh, they've got little small, they've got small mouths, nimble lips, which makes them very selective grazers. So the, um, the size of the mouth of the animal is related to how selective they can be. So, so a sheep can be very selective. It can pick the nutritious, uh, wildflowers out from the sward, which is not particularly helpful when you're trying to maintain species rich grasslands. Uh, they're also not ideal for winter grazing on heathland because they really like to eat heather because they need really nutritious forage. So goats, again, not native to the UK, but they can be used as proxies for deer grazing where, where we can contain them. <laughs> and so yeah, again, they're They've got nimble little lips, but they much prefer browsing to grazing, so really good for keeping bramble under control and any unwanted scrub. Um, they're not weatherproof. The only places where deer survive as feral animals tend to be places where you've got cover like rocky outcrops, crags, caves, etc., where they can gain shelter. But otherwise you have to provide artificial shelter, and they're incredibly good at climbing and escaping, so they're a bit of a, <laughs> a, bit of a difficult one. Uh, ponies, again, really important, a really, really important part of our cultural heritage in Wales. Uh, the Welsh, the pony, Welsh ponies are, you know, across all the mountains of Wales. We've got, uh, you know, particular types in particular areas. You've got the Carnethau ponies in the Carnethau range in North Wales. You've got Gower salt marsh ponies. You've got, you know, all different hill pony improvement societies across, across Wales. Really, really important. These are not ruminants like goats and cattle and sheep, but they are hindergut fermenters. They've got teeth on the top and the bottom. They, they are designed to consume a huge amount of low quality forage. So really useful just for clearing vast amounts of vegetation from a place quickly. Um, they don't, they hold a home range unlike, uh, like cattle, sheep, I'm oh, sorry. Yes, cattle, sheep and goats who migrate across an area naturally. These will hold a home range, which means that they produce this lawn and latrine behavior. So they graze lawns really, really short and they dung in other places, which they call, can call, people call them roughs as well. Uh, that's to keep their, they don't graze those roughs, that's to keep the, their dung away from their grazing areas so they don't re-ingest parasites. So over time, you'll notice in pony pastures that you get a lot of, well, they get horse sick, people call it. And so you get lots of very nutritionally improved, uh, so you've got you know, improved areas, so lots of nutrients in those areas and really impoverished areas, which are usually more species rich. So it's important to cross graze, use different species, not just one single species. Cattle are my favorites. So <laughs> we'll mainly talk about cows. Uh, so, uh, Cattle are, are ruminants as well. So they like, they're not very selective because they've got wide muzzles. They like to, to wrap their tongue around vegetation and pull it up. They also do a lot of browsing. They're heavy. Uh, and so where they lie and walk, they create a lot more disturbance. Um, incredibly useful animals. And they're lovely, aren't they? <laughs> so, um, all right, so, uh, they conservate, well, grazing is so important. Well, the presence of large herbivores is so important for so many different reasons. So one being that they keep uh, water courses open, obviously without disturbance from livestock, that pool would, dry, would um, scrub over. So lots of willow would come in, brambles, etc. cetera. Um, and then also you need the disturbance of livestock or, or large herbivores around the water course for really rare species like this uh, pillwort, a little tiny fern species, which really needs that trampled area around the margin of pools. We've also got fairy shrimp, which, uh, which are present in um, uh, ephemeral pools, 
quite a lot of commons used to have them. They tra the eggs would travel around on, uh, and the adults would travel around on the hooves of animals, which doesn't happen so much anymore. And then the medicinal leech, so they would feed on animals that would enter the water course. Uh, they become increasingly rare now because we use, tend to use avamectin wormers, wormers, which will kill all invertebrate life, as mentioned previously. So also livestock produce dung and urine, uh, not mixed together, which makes it slurry, which is an unnatural product, but separately. And it's really, really important for invertebrates. So this is a door beetle, one of our dung beetle species. There's a plethora of dung beetle species and other invertebrates which inhabit dung and really, really important cycling nutrients. And then that, those insects are then food for birds and bats. So another reason why keeping avamectin wormless to a minimum is really, really important. So also livestock create their ground. So going back to the diagram of ecological succession, uh, this, you know, this bare ground is created by a cow walking along, scraping a bit of turf off. You see all the little seedlings coming through, you know, which wouldn't happen if, they were, if the sward was closed. Uh, they also have hair, which machines don't. So <laughs> hair is really, really important. Uh, you can see these jackdaws plucking hair off some Hereford bulls in the spring, so they'll use that for their nests. Uh, here, uh, you probably can't see it very well, but this is a dunnock nest, apparently, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, this is in a Malinia tussock, and you can see the Hereford cattle hair lying in the nest. You know, that's a really important overlooked feature. So cattle also like to browse <clears throat> well, all you know, all species will browse to an extent, but cattle are very good at it, quite good at disturbing. So uh, they'll also shake trees. I think that's often overlooked. You know, like trees are supposed to exist with herbivores grazing them, browsing them. I mean, so uh, they actually shape the trees by taking the lower branches and they create these characteristic feature trees that we have throughout the landscape. Uh, so also they control invasive non-native species. Now, different, different species will do this to a lesser or greater degree. Cattle are really good for <clears throat> uh, Himalayan balsam, as are goats. Sheep not quite so much and ponies don't really touch it, uh, but really useful. So also for reducing the fuel load, which leads to catastrophic wildfire, which leads to uh, destruction of, of reptile um, habitat and, and bird habitat, or well, habitat for anything really. Um, so because they consume this flammable vegetation, it means that there's a lot less, um, a lot less, well, the fires are less severe, basically. They'll still, usually will still take off, but they won't be as severe as they would be had there been a bigger fuel load. So they also create paths which can act as fire breaks. Clearly in this case, it hasn't worked, but um, because of the height of that gorse, presumably, but very important feature because uh, as you're all aware, we've lost grazing livestock from a lot of our commons or certainly it's, they've been destocked and you'll see the resultant uh, rise in fuel load. Really important for uh, producing the correct sward height for, um, for our grassland fungi. And there are certain species of fungus that will only live on dung as well. Really important. So some of our birds that are absolutely reliant on appropriate grazing. So um, the chaff there, they'll, they need a short sward for feeding. They will need dung from untreated livestock in order to have enough invertebrates to feed on. Uh, the ring ousel really likes um, pony grazing actually um, on heathlands, and, you know, other appropriate grazing, pony grazing seems to produce the right kind of sward structure. So they need longer vegetation to nest in and they need short vegetation and dung to produce the insects, which they need to feed on and feed their chicks. Uh, lapwing rely on short graze swords. So, you know, that's best produced by, um, by livestock grazing. Uh, so the pied fly catcher is there. They rely on the presence of livestock within a, an open grazed woodland to attract the small insects they need to feed themselves and their chicks. And woodcock, our winter visitors, they'll come and feed in uh, dung pats on the open fields usually in the winter. 
So, like, we always hear <laughs> that. Um, that was a very blurry photo, but you get the idea. Uh, we always hear that livestock, particularly cattle, are very, very bad news. But um, um, I hope I'll change your mind because we, I think you'll agree that this up here, I don't know if you can see it very well, but that's a CAFO, a feedlot in America. So that's thousands and thousands of cattle all crammed into a small patch of land being fed on grain for a very short period of time, uh, producing a lot of waste. Uh, don't even see a blade of grass. You know, there's a very different story to uh, a cow here grazing on of our grasslands. We grow grass like nothing else, you know, uh, and on land that's uncroppable. You know, that's a very different story to a CAFO. So that's, you know, globally, agriculture might be a contributor, but you in the UK, you know, ruminant livestock production is very sustainable. So these are the... Green, UK greenhouse gas emissions for 2016. I'm sorry, I haven't got a more up-to-date slide, but I can't find a good infographic for it. So um, you can see here that in UK, agriculture as a whole is 10% of our greenhouse gas uh, emission. So, and about 5% of that is, is livestock. So, you know, are we really looking at the right thing here? We can, like sustainable food systems look different according to where you live. And in the UK, we can sustainably produce ruminant meat from ruminants. And also by not by vilifying livestock, we're completely missing the fact that they're an important part of a lot of our nutrient cycles, particularly the carbon cycle. So you can see here there's the carbon cycle. There is the biogenic carbon cycle. They might release methane, which is a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2 but they're cycling it and the um, methane breaks down after about 10 or 12 years, whereas CO2, which you're producing through burning of fossil fuels, has got a, a survives in the, in the atmosphere for 100 plus years. So, you know, it's really important. They're also an important part of the phosphorus cycle and nitrogen cycle. You know, they're just an important part of the ecosystem. I think you might get the point by now. So, and also we've got to look below ground as well as above ground for at our habitats. Our soil health is very important. It does help, it's a healthy soil sequesters a lot of carbon due to the amount of life that exists in it. Uh, so without livestock, we won't have healthy soils. So sermon has ended, but we'll go on to some of the considerations for uh, when we have when we want to get livestock onto a site so and really quickly i'll go through them infrastructure you have to make sure there's appropriate fencing they need water they really need handling and loading facilities because agriculture is very dangerous so uh you know you need to make sure everything's as safe as possible for humans and livestock they need appropriate shelter we've got a lot of legislation a lot of hoops to jump through when we're when we're doing anything with livestock in the uk uh, we have to make sure that toxic and injurious plants are considered. We need to check our stock. We need to have the suitable livestock, livestock that's adapted to the type of habitat you want them to graze. Got to get the graziers on board and make sure you take their, their um, needs into consideration. You've really got to look at public access. There's a huge conflict between livestock and, uh, and people, basically. Uh, biosecurity. Making sure if you cut graze common land, you've got commons rights to consider, appropriate insurance, coastal sites, tides, not appropriate in the break of vegans, uh, fire, and making sure that there's appropriate escape routes through vegetation, etc. There's loads more considerations, but just so you get the picture, it's quite complicated when you're trying to plan grazing on a site. So that brings me on to a case study. Uh, so as I mentioned before, we... Uh, produced a grazing plan for Gangor. So for the, I know that Gangor has already been mentioned uh, before, but um, <coughs> it's, um, so a guy Vach and a guy Vau, they, it, together they're the largest hill fort in southern Wales. Um, <clears throat> absolutely incredible. You've got the rem remnants of old field systems down there. So Gangor is just outside Bethlehem. I, you probably all know it much better than me, but um, it's an absolutely beautiful place. It's a common, so Gangor Commoners Association uh, graze it, um, 
and also it's owned by uh, Brecon Beacons National Park. So, <clears throat> sorry, Brana Brecon York National Park. Um, so uh, there's a few, there's been a few attempts to try and get appropriate grazing on it over the years. Unfortunately, it lost quite a lot of its stock over um, over time. Uh, it was grazed by sheep um, and ponies and historically cattle, but not for a very long time. Uh, sheep grazing was removed largely about 10 years ago. And as a result, the heath came back. So in, in the middle of the garden, we've got uh, oh, that that area there has has returned to heathland really nicely, um, and it's also a lot of dry acid grassland, which has become very bracken dominated um, due to the removal of livestock and also additional nitrogen in the air, which cause well climate change as mentioned before, but it causes a proliferation of bracken. So um, during the time when um, there were very few stock on the common. Uh, fallow deer have done a really good job of keeping scrub to a minimum, although it, you know it's still it is still taking over. Yeah, you can see that the probably found dropping. You know, at several visits, droppings, and they they've been stripping bark off some of the birch saplings that have encroached on the northern side. <clears throat> so you can see here that this. You've got trees advancing up the slope towards the uh, Ix Scheduled Ancient Monument, um, which can be really damaging. You know, uh, the bracken rhizomes and the tree roots and the, the you know the bramble etc. They can dislodge all the archaeological remains, and it also s screens the uh, the beautiful uh, hill fort from view as well. So you can see it's you know it's becoming quite quite scrubby. So. Um, you know, there's been efforts over the years with uh, volunteers and a lot of um, effort by the National Park to cut areas with machinery, but it's very hill, very rocky, very difficult to get onto it with machine and very, very steep as well. So grazing really is the solution. Um, see, the gorse is really taking over, constricting the footpaths and the desire lines, um, which means that there's a lot more damage to, with by walking on the footpaths. There's a, when we were speaking to the Commoners Association, one of the issues they flagged up was the fact that there's a lot of dog mess. So in 2018, we, uh, so a, a student, Connor John, who was working for National Park, with the National Park, did a survey on, with dog walkers, um, informing them that we wanted to turn out more cattle and you know, get their opinions, et cetera, and trying to get on top of the, the reasons why they wouldn't collect dog mess. So, that was something that there was one of the reasons that the commoners didn't want to turn cattle out. Didn't expect that to be there. These are the water points on the common, which, uh, yeah, you see the, these are where cattle gain, well, livestock gain water access. And there was a bit of a worry that um, some of the water points uh, were becoming a bit too poached and damaging the features. So these, uh, this is a map that, of the vegetation management and suggestions that we had. Uh, so we decided to, uh, that the woodland and scrub on the fringes would be best left. It's too difficult to manage it and advance too, too far to do much about it. Uh, the acid grassland here uh, you know, needed grazing. The heathland here in purple also needs grazing appropriately, which we'll come on to. And these pathways needed to be cleared and widened to avoid too much poaching and damage to the feature, the historic environment feature. <clears throat> so this is what the ideal grazing regime was decided to be. So we decided sheep during July, August, September, October, because they just be, they will have just been shorn, which means they wouldn't get tangled in brambles. Uh, so they would would be there to to clear the scrub predominantly. Um, we need cattle year round, so cattle are really important for reducing uh, the bracken because they trample, they lie on it, so that damages the rhizomes and causes uh, the sap to bleed out, which reduces the energy in the rhizome, and then. Over the years, there's less of a the, the bracken's less uh, tall and vigorous, and then we also 
really need ponies on there and they would focus on the gorse during the winter because ponies are really good or particularly native ponies that have been reared on similar habitats they're really good at taking gorse so so pony grazing during the winter cattle grazing year round and then sheep uh sheep are sort of late summer early autumn or in the autumn so they would you'd allow a lot of species to flower and set seed before you introduce the sheep so you weren't affecting the floristic diversity so that would be the ideal but obviously with commons commons have got rights and they can exercise them however they like so what you re what really needs to be done is to incentivize farmers to graze appropriately so whether that's through a payment for outcomes scheme or at least through one of our national agri-environment schemes so we really need to make sure that you know there's sufficient support for farmers going forward because we're it's looking very bleak at the moment unfortunately so we in 2018 we put in a, a dog poo wormery and some uh, with biodegradable bags and signage etc and that was to encourage cattle graziers to turn cattle out so that we reduce the amount of dog mess around because that is a real problem in terms of a disease called neosporosis so that causes infertility and abortion in uh, pregnant heifers and cows which is completely irreversible cat it's a little protozoan which is carried in dog feces so uh, that was really successful and um, there was so Connor John as I mentioned earlier he did he, he surveyed uh, before we put this uh, dog for Wormery out, we did a, another survey afterwards, and uh, there was a decline in the amount or decrease in the amount of uh, dog feces on the common. So that was really good news. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, uh, a cattle grazier turned out their herd of Dexter cattle, which had a brilliant impact on the on the common. So going into the future, as well as suitable agri-environment schemes. <laughs> it's okay, we're nearly, I'm nearly done. <laughs> um, as well as suitable agri-environment schemes and payment for outcomes schemes that, you know, that Park could put in place. Uh, these uh, no fence collars are really useful. I've been using these for, since 2021 uh, to keep my cattle here off a uh, very busy road on a Gower Common. Uh, it's been really successful and these are geofencing, virtual fencing systems. So this collar, solar charged collar, uh, emits a warning sound uh, and uh, as they approach the sort of this virtual line that you've drawn and then as they approach the line they get if they ignore the, the the warning sound they'll get a pulse that happens three times and then they've escaped but if you train them appropriately they it's a really successful way of uh, of geofencing virtual fencing areas so this is really re revolutionized grazing um on well particularly conservation grazing so you could actually use this on gango for example to focus grazing on particular areas or to keep them off the the historic environment feature if needed if damage was occurring and keep them away from damage uh, damaging watering points etc and it's also got a really interesting feature where uh, you can use a qr code which will allow you access to the web browser and it will show you where all of the collars are in your in a 20 kilometer radius of your location so yeah, thank you very much for listening.